Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at streams and flooding. So the next topic we're going to think about is how do streams transport sediment and erode their channels and this is going to correspond to section 16.2 of your textbook. So the first thing we're going to think about is how do rivers transport material and why is that material deposited? So the first thing we need to remember is that the size of a material the size of material that a river can move is dependent on the energy of the river. Typically, the more energy your river has, the larger the material it can move. So when a river is moving material, it can move it in one of two ways. It can either move it in the water or it can move it as part of the bed load. And the bed load is a collection of loose sediment, which is essentially along the bottom of the river channel. So we're going to begin by thinking about the ways in which the river can move uh, sediment and materials as part of the water. So the first way that it can move sediment is in suspension. And this is when you have very, very small clasts held in suspension in the river water. So this process can only really apply to the lightest class sizes. So that's going to be clays and silts. Typically, anything which is a sand or larger cannot be held in suspension in the river. It's just too heavy. Now, the other way that material can be moved as part of the water is in solution. So the material has been dissolved in the water. And of course, you might remember the process of dissolution. And you know, this is a process that tends to take place uh, with rocks like limestone, where the interaction between the water and the uh, limestone uh, causes the limestone to dissolve, releasing ions which get dissolved within the water. Now, in terms of moving material as part of the bed load, it can be moved in one of two ways. So the first way that this can be achieved is saltation. And saltation is essentially a leapfrog motion. So as the river's moving along, it will pick up a clast for a short period of time, transport it in suspension, but then the weight of the clast will cause that clast to be dropped back down into the bed load. So you get this hopping motion and this is referred to as saltation. Now, this typically applies to sand-sized class. Normally, anything larger than a sand is too heavy to be picked up by the river water unless that river water is really moving with a lot of energy. Now, the main way that anything larger than a sand is going to be transported is through traction. And traction is the process through which the force of the water rolls or slides clasts along the bottom of the channel. So it's simply a pushing force. Once again, the more energy your river has, the larger the size of class that it can move through traction. So a very fast flowing mountain river can in theory move class the size of boulders because it has enough force to physically push them along the channel. Now, as we discussed, uh, the material that's being transported by saltation and traction is part of the river's bed load. Now, all of these processes will be moving sediment as long as there is sufficient energy. Now, the thing about rivers is that as the river begins to lose energy, it will change the maximum size of class which it can move. So very, very, very fast flowing energetic water can obviously move a large range of material. It can move everything from clay sized clasts all the way up to boulders. And it can only move boulders because it has so much energy. Now, as the amount of energy the river has begins to decrease, the size range of classes that can move begins to get smaller. So as the energy drops, obviously your river will then become incapable of transporting boulders, then it will become incapable of transporting cobbles, then it will become incapable of transporting gravels, sand, silts, and then eventually if the water comes to an almost complete stop, it will even deposit clay. So the process of deposition is a reflection of the amount of energy that your river has. As that river energy begins to decrease, it will naturally have to dis start depositing sediment, which is too large for it to transport. So what processes does a river use to actually erode its channel? And remember, rivers are constantly in motion. They're constantly eroding both the bottom of the channel and the sides of the channel. And this causes your river to move over time. So one of the ways in which a river can erode material is simply by picking up clasts due to turbulence in the water, which creates low pressure areas. And this will literally pull material off the bed of the river and pick it up and hold it in the water for a short period of time. So think of it like saltation. 
Now, this movement of class will eventually lead to class colliding when they hit each other or they hit obstacles within the river channel itself. And this is going to cause your class to both break down. So over time, all these impacts is going to make your class smaller. But the impact itself can also be capable of causing class to break off the material which is being struck. So if we look here, we can see we have a ridge of some kind of rock which is, uh, in, which is um, coming into the river channel. So we have exposed rock here. So if you can pick this class up and hit the class against this area of exposed rock with enough force, you can in theory chip pieces off this area of exposed rock, thereby creating new clasts, but also eroding the river channel. Over time, this raised area will steadily be eroded away, creating a smoother channel. So when the water's moving, we know that it's going to create turbulence. And typically, the rougher the channel, the more turbulence there is going to be. So if you have a very smooth-sided river channel, the water is going to be able to flow with minimum turbulence. As soon as the channel margins begin to become rougher, it's going to create more turbulence. Now, one of the things that turbulence does is it creates these low-pressure regions. And these turbulent low pressure regions can in some cases be strong enough to actually physically loosen and lift pieces of material from the stream bed. And the material that could be moved could be clasts, or it could even be pieces of exposed rock. So once again, it's helping to pick up pieces of material and over time it's going to lead to the steady erosion of this area of rock. And so you're thinking, well, hold on, what's actually causing this area of rock to begin to break down? Well, we've already discussed one method, which is of course the, the impact of clasts against this area of exposed rock. But we also have to consider the process of dissolution, so dissolving the, uh, the rock itself. And we know that when uh, rock is exposed to water, we know that the rock uh, is typically exposed to water, which is going to be slightly acidic in most cases. That can lead to a reaction which results in dissolution. So when a limestone comes in contact with a slightly acidic water, there's a reaction there and that causes the limestone to break down. But we also have the process, of course, of uh, hydration or hydrolysis, should I say, when we have a chemical reaction between the minerals in the rock and the water itself. And that will typically cause minerals like feldspar to break down and produce clay minerals, which can then be picked up and transported by the river. So the process of uh, dissolving the rock due to interactions between the water and the rock will also help to degrade that rock over time. And that can mean the degraded rock is more susceptible to damage from impacts or from turbulence picking up pieces of rock straight from the exposed uh, crest of rock here. So the final topic we're going to think about is turbulence. So we've already discussed that turbulence tends to be greater when the river has a rough channel. And that makes sense because the more uh, impediments you put in the way of the water, the more chaotic the flow is going to become. So turbulence essentially is a reflection of the viscosity of the liquid. Now we know that water is a relatively low viscosity fluid, so we know it's going to flow quite easily. But even though it does flow quite easily, it still does offer some resistance to flow. So typically, the slower the water is moving, it's going to offer more resistance. And so the water flow is on the whole going to be smoother. Now, we also have the surface tension of the water itself. So along the surface here, we're going to have the, the physical force of the atoms of the molecule, should I say, holding themselves together. And this is also going to help to keep the flow along the top of the water relatively smooth. Typically, uh, this is most easily achieved at lower velocities. As the velocity begins to become higher, the amount of turbulence begins to increase. So moving water naturally has inertia. So it's going to try and keep moving with the same speed in the same direction. And, and that's just basic physics. So all in all, you know, the water is going to want to move and we know that water is going to want to move downhill and it's going to do its best to move as quickly as possible. And so it's going to try and find the path of least resistance. And so that could either involve the river having to go round an obstacle or in time, the river may be capable of eroding away the obstacle, helping to improve the speed at which it can move. 
Now, at higher velocities or near obstacles, the flow will naturally become more chaotic, so it will become more turbulent, and it will form lots of swirling bodies of water within the channel, which we refer to as eddies. And these eddies are going to be important because these help to create the low pressure regions within which we can have class being picked up and thrown against each other, we can have class being picked up and thrown against the channel margin, or we can have these low pressure regions where we actually have class being pulled out of the, the riverbed itself. Itself. Now you're thinking, well, hold on, well, how does the higher velocity tend to lead to more chaotic flow? Well, just think about your car. Typically, when you get in your car, put it into gear, you start moving. When you're moving at lower speeds, you can begin to accelerate quite quickly. And this is because at lower speeds, the amount of drag which your car is suffering is lower. Therefore, you can accelerate more easily. As you start going faster, the amount of drag begins to increase, and so it will cause the airflow around your car to become more turbulent, and this means your car will find it more difficult to push through the air. And so at higher speeds, it's more difficult to keep accelerating. So this obviously helps to explain why cars have a top speed, which they can't get past, because there comes a point where the engine just can't provide any more energy to push them forward any faster. And the same kind of thing happens with rivers, as the velocity begins to increase you have an increase in drag between the air above the river and the banks and bed and the banks and bed of the river and this is this drag is going to create a naturally more chaotic and turbulent flow so it's not surprising that in relatively fast flowing bodies of water you tend to get this more chaotic uh, turbulent flow now, as we've discussed, the fact that we have these areas of turbulence and these eddies help to create low pressure regions, which can lead to loose material being picked up and thrown, or simply loose material being picked up and eroded from the river bed or the river margins. All right. Thank you for watching, everybody, and have a good day.